Good to see you in church this morning on this holiday weekend. It's so nice to see the grass turning such a nice bright green on the golf course. (laughs) The world just seems a little better place these days, doesn't it? Well, last Sunday I uh, shared a message with you that I called the power of influence and it was based off of the example of the young pastor Timothy who had been so greatly impacted by his mother and grandmother. And today I want to share a second message with you on this same topic. In the first message we discussed the fact that we are all the products of influence. Whether we even realize it or not, our life experiences, the people we've interacted with, the things we have been taught, have all shaped the way we think and the way we act. These influences have been both positive and negative, but either way, there's no denying the power of influence in our lives. We're being influenced every day, but we are also being influencers as well. And the scriptures warn us that we will give an account for how we've lived our lives. The scriptures also challenge us to shine in such a way that men will see our lives and glorify our God in heaven as a result. We have no choice in the fact that our lives are being influenced and no choice in the fact that we are influencers, but we do have a choice and we do have a say in the kind of influence we're going to have. So with that in mind, I gave you three thoughts on how we could maximize our influence in a positive manner. We saw that personal character and authenticity and consistency will increase our level of influence. When you have these three things, you will always have a voice and you will always have an opportunity to have a positive impact in someone's life. Well, that's a quick recap of last week. Isn't it amazing how I can recap an entire sermon in in five minutes and you go, why does it take so long for you to get that all out? Yeah? Well, I want to give you some additional thoughts this morning. I have some additional things to share with you that I think will help us as we consider further this idea of influence. You know, one of the difficult things about being a preacher is that in a 35-minute sermon... You don't have uh, the time to expand on all the angles of a topic. And sometimes what really challenges and encourages one can feel condemning and discouraging to another. I've been in situations myself where I've been both challenged and discouraged at the exact same time. I remember being a part of a trip, I think I've shared this before, going to the Dream Center in L.A. and being so inspired by what kind of an impact a church could have and being so influenced by this young pastor, Matthew Burnett. I don't even think he was 25 years old at the time, and he was just killing it as a pastor of a church. And it was so inspirational on the one hand, and yet I... I had to battle this feeling of inadequacy the whole time uh, that I was there because I'm thinking I'm older than than this guy and I haven't done anything yet in my life. So last week I shared this message on the power of influence. And I talk about how Timothy had a grandmother and a mother who had this living faith that they passed on to him. And I shared about my own family and the kind of influence my parents had on me because of the way they lived their life. And hopefully that was challenging and inspirational, but I have no doubt some other questions or thoughts could have come as a result. Questions like, well, my kid didn't turn out so great, so did I fail as a parent? Or I did everything I could to influence my children to follow the Lord, but they aren't right now, so what's the deal with that? Maybe the enemy even whispered about how you lacked in some of those three areas that I pointed out and talked to to you about that and, and you felt more condemned than you did inspired. The enemy's good at that. Sometimes we can look at someone whose life is falling apart and we can attribute it. Well, it's just because of the negative environment they grew up in. But then we see someone else who grew up in the same environment and yet they're flourishing. Or we look at someone who grew up in what appeared to be this great situation, and yet now their life seems to be a mess. And what about the kids that grew up in the exact same family, had the same influence, and yet 
walked two completely different paths when they got older. I can tell you that as a coach and a teacher, I know I've had real influence with some of my students and players, but with others, I scratch my head because I feel like I had none. And these kinds of thoughts and questions lead me to make the following observation about influence that I think we all need to remember, and that's this. I can control my influence, but I can't guarantee the outcome. As I've said before, I have to take responsibility for the kind of influence I'm having on those around me. I will have to give an account for it. But here is a mistake that many people make. They also take all the responsibility for the outcome as well. But the reality is every person has their own conscience and makes their own choices and is ultimately responsible for their own actions. And this truth is actually seen in the scriptures I read with you last week about Timothy. Let me read them again. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Paul writes to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. It's why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Notice that even as Paul alludes to the fact that Timothy has been influenced by his grandmother and his mother, he still challenges him that he needs to take some action. He has been given much by his upbringing, even by impartation from Paul himself, but the challenge to him is that it will remain dormant unless he fans it into flame. A few verses later, Paul challenges him, to hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learned from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that's been entrusted to you. Notice again that just because he's been given much and had great influences in his life, there is a danger that Timothy could lose a hold of these things. In 2 Timothy verse, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, Paul adds, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. And so Paul clearly recognizes that just because Timothy had great influence at home and even from himself, there is no guarantee of the outcome. Paul can exhort, he can remind, he can encourage, but ultimately Timothy's going to do what Timothy decides he's going to do. You know, one of the scariest moments in parenting is when we discover we have a lot less control over the outcome than we thought. As our kids get older, we get humbled. When they're little, they're so needy. They want us to hold them. They climb up on our laps. They believe everything we tell them. And we have so much control over their decisions. But there comes a point when things begin to shift. I had to laugh recently uh, when I saw this t-shirt advertised on my Facebook news feed. Mama, mommy, mom, bra. When you hit the bra stage, your control over your children is pretty much over. Would you agree with that? You know, in parenting, we realize that our influence has various seasons to it. There are times when we have a lot of influence but also times where we aren't given the same opportunity or where we wonder if we're being ever, or even if we're being heard anymore. And here's my point. We need to be realistic and realize that there are always two sides to the influence coin. No matter where I'm trying to be a positive influence, I never have a time when I hold all the cards. I'm not the only voice that someone will hear. Influences are coming from everywhere. 
and they're all vying for a seat at the table. As a kid, I grew up fairly sheltered, I would say. My parents did everything in their power to manage the kind of influences that came into my life. We lived out in the country. I went to a small Christian school. We didn't even have a television when I was growing up. I'd say that for 12 years, they had a pretty good handle on who was sitting at the influence table in my life. But when I was 13, things began to change. We moved to the big city of Regina. I made a lot of new friends in the neighborhood. They had TVs. And they had movies. And some of my friends had the kind of movies that were hidden in the rafters in the basement. You know what I'm talking about. They spoke different. They had different morals. And I wanted to belong. In that season, the chairs at my influence table were occupied by a lot more people than my parents. I will tell you, it was debatable who was sitting at the head of the table. And then university came and presented a whole other side of life. And by that point, other influences were beginning to drown out my Christian upbringing. And many of you know that it was a sovereign encounter with the Lord at a fork in the road moment of my life that caused me to go one direction while many were going another. My sister had a time in her life where she chose a completely different path and it wasn't until God in his mercy got a hold of her that she turned back to the Lord. And I remember during that time when Tracy was really going off the rails in her life and was really struggling. That my parents were feeling very discouraged, very defeated. And the enemy was whispering all sorts of lies in their minds. And maybe some of you know this and some of you don't, but my dad tendered his resignation during that time. But the elders of the church refused it. You see, my dad was making a mistake at that time. He wasn't just taking responsibility for his influence. He was also taking full responsibility for the outcome. And the enemy was beating him up that somehow he had failed as a parent and was magnifying his mistakes or his perceived mistakes. And I remember, I don't know, Dad, if you remember this, but I remember sitting my dad down and saying, listen to me, Dad. It's one of the first times I talked like that. Said, so listen to me, Dad. I grew up in the exact same house. You were a great dad, but you don't hold all the cards. And Tracy has the power to make her own choice. I honestly believe that my sister and I are some of the most blessed people on earth. She would say the same. We grew up in about as wholesome of of an environment as possible. I realize that many in this world are not so fortunate as I've been. But despite that fact, Tracy had some really difficult years, and I was literally two weeks away from turning my back on the whole thing. My parents could control their influence, but they couldn't guarantee the outcome. I can tell you that I'm trying my best to be a godly influence on my kids. But I realize I don't hold all the cards, and that's scary. I've told them repeatedly, there is a narrow path that leads to life and a broad path that leads to destruction. Angie and I, we're doing everything in our power to put up roadblocks, to build a wall at the entrance to the path that leads to destruction. I'm standing there with flashing lights, directing traffic, go, saying, go the other way. Go to the narrow path. I've told my kids, I'm going to stand at the entrance to the, uh, at the gates of the broad path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in front of you in every way that I can. I'm going to be pointing you to go that way. I'm building the wall. But if you want to push me aside and climb over the wall... I won't be able to stop you. I wish I could guarantee the outcome, 
but I can't. Every person has to make a choice to how they will respond to the influences around them, no matter how good or how bad. Can I remind you that there is no better father than God? Would you agree with that? How did he do with his first kids? Adam and Eve gave in to a different kind of influence, didn't they? So maybe you should give yourself a little grace, parents. Jesus had 12 guys follow him everywhere he went for three years. And yet one of them betrayed him horribly, ultimately resulting in his crucifixion. Peter, his closest friend, left him for a while and denied even knowing him. So did Jesus fail? In the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus told where he describes the father heart of God, isn't it interesting that we see the father having to let his son go? He couldn't control his final decisions. And there's a valuable lesson in that story that I want us to realize. It reminds me of something wise that my father told me in regard to parenting my sister and I. He said this to me. He said, I always did everything in my power to keep a relationship with you guys no matter what. I always felt that as long as I had a relationship, I still had a pipeline into your lives where I could make a deposit. If I lost the relationship, I knew I would lose the pipeline. And I see this in the story of the prodigal. When the son disrespectfully demanded his inheritance, the father with humility and grace gave it to him. But as he gave it to him, he would have had to forgive him as he gave it to him. Even though the son wasn't asking for it or repenting at that moment. Later, the son would come begging for it. But he didn't realize that when the father gave him the inheritance, he would have already had to make the choice to forgive him then. If the father had flown off the handle, if he would have disowned him, if he would have turned his back on him in that moment, he would have severed the pipeline of influence. Later, when the son came to his senses, even though he felt like no, he was no longer worthy to be a son, there was still something that told him you can return. His father's response to his return was one that allowed the relationship to flourish and I believe would have opened the door for even greater influence. You know, one of the reasons why my sister is walking with Jesus today is because even though my parents were hurt and even wounded by her decisions, they forgave her and they always kept their arms open to her. Several in this church refused to let her go. You know who you are. They went out of their way to keep relationship with her. And ultimately, there was a day when those relationships allowed tremendous influence to come back into her life. Church, sometimes out of fear, we try to control what we can't control. Did you notice that the father in the prodigal story didn't try to control his son? In fact, he seems more silent than we might tend to be. Is there a lesson there? Sometimes in order to have opportunity for influence later, we have to be quiet and let go. Sometimes it takes more maturity, patience, and faith to be quiet than it does to speak. It reminds us that in all areas of influence, we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to know how he wants us to respond. There is a time to speak, and there is a time to be quiet. Lord, help us to know the difference. But as long as it depends on us, we do everything we can to keep the relationships in our lives intact. Because we never know when that relationship is going to give us a pipeline for influence. Church, our responsibility is to control our influence, but we have to give up control of the outcome into the hands of God. 
Paul said these words in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Even if you're the best planter, it's only God who can make that seed grow. You can control your influence, but you can't guarantee the outcome. The final thought I want to give you is that when it comes to influence, we need to realize that not all light shines the same way. Not all light shines the same. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus spoke about our influence using the illustration of light. He said in Matthew 5, verse 14, You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So with these words, Jesus challenged us to shine bright and to not hide our light. We have a message of hope, a message of love, and a message of salvation. And that message is to be preached, but it's also to be lived. But I want us to notice the challenge to put the lamp on the stand. Put it in a place where everyone in the house can be affected by it. It speaks of deliberate action. And when I look at the examples that Jesus used here, I see two different kinds of light. There is the city on a hill which has a certain kind of light. Its effects are seen by many. They're seen from a long ways away. But the effects, I would suggest, are more broad than they are deep. It speaks more of a general influence. As we talked about last week, when we have character, authenticity, and consistency, that kind of life will speak to a lot of people. But this kind of influence often happens more as a byproduct, I would say, than by specific intention. A lamp on a lampstand, however, has a specific purpose or task. It's to give light in a certain location to a certain focused group. Its light is brighter because it's seen from up close. Its effects have a deeper impact because the focus is more specific. If you turn on the light in your kitchen when it's dark at night, you will notice quickly its effects. And I think Jesus used these two examples intentionally because they speak of two different kinds of influence. God wants us to live in such a way that we are like a city on a hill. The way we live our lives should shine out and be visible for all to see. But he also wants us to live our lives with focused intention. And he calls us to specific people and situations where the challenge is to put our light on the stand. When I look at the ministry of Jesus, I see both of these lights illustrated. He spoke to large crowds of people. They witnessed miracles. They heard his teaching. His influence was broad. But then there were the 12 disciples that Jesus intentionally called. And even within the 12, there were the three that he was especially close to. The 12 experienced a different kind of light than the crowd. To them, Jesus was a lamp on the stand. They were in his house. They lived with him. They ate with him. They walked with him. They saw and heard things that no one else was privy to. They were discipled intentionally with a specific purpose in the mind of Jesus. Ultimately, it was that level of discipleship, I think we could argue, that produced the most fruit in Jesus' ministry. You see, the more you focus the light, the more power it has. We're all aware of a laser beam. Now, you will not find lasers naturally in nature. Lasers are artificially made in a sense. It's light by design. But that design can cut through the hardest substances on earth 
and also be used for some of the most delicate surgeries. Church, we are all called to make disciples. We have a purpose to fulfill. God wants to use each and every one of us. He places us in various locations and situations. Some of those are daily in terms of school, work, and play. Other times God will just drop us into a location because he has set us up for a divine appointment. These are moments when we can choose to let our light shine and put it on the stand or we can keep it hidden under a basket. Let me challenge you with this thought. I know many good people whose lives, I would say, shine like a city on a hill. They have good character. They're good people. They live consistent lives. And so they're having a certain measure of influence. Solid people. But I can look at these same people and realize that in some ways, even though they're shining like a city on a hill, they haven't put their light on a lampstand. They have wisdom that's not being given. Talents that are buried. Love that's being withheld for all sorts of factors like complacency or fear or being too busy with other things. We've been discussing how relationship is the pipeline for the greatest influence. To me... That's the kind of influence that's more like a lamp on a stand or a laser-like in its ability to cut and to heal. But relationships take time and effort. They take active looking and even invitations like Jesus gave to those 12 that he called to follow him. They literally involve sharing your life with somebody and doing it together. But everyone is capable of that kind of influence. Everyone is capable of shining that kind of light. It doesn't require a stage. It doesn't require a microphone. It simply requires reaching for one with a heart of love. It might be getting on the Love Lives Here bus. It might be knocking on a door with city kids. Opening your home to leading a life group. Visiting your neighbor in the hospital. Bringing groceries to the single mom across the street. Inviting one of the new immigrants into your home. Taking the time to develop a close relationship with someone in the church. But everyone is capable of shining that kind of light. I want to end this morning by challenging you, church. Live a life of influence. Live in such a way that your life shines like a city on a hill for all to see. But would you also look for ways to put your lamp on a stand? Can you recognize those opportunities and those relationships that God has placed right in front of you? Will you refuse to hide the light that God has given you or will you put it on the stand? Remember, you can't control the outcome. And you may wonder at times if the shining is having any effect. But I believe if you will just determine I'm going to keep shining anyways, no matter what, you will be amazed at what God will do through your life and the lives of those around you. Amen? Is that all right? Hey everyone, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you enjoyed it and found something that spoke to you or blessed you in some way. That really is the heart of Harvest City Church, that you take what you've heard, learned, or experienced here, and then go out and share that good news with others. So go ahead and post this video to your page, start conversations, and who knows the lives that God could transform through it. If we can support you in some way in this season, please let us know. Maybe you've decided to dedicate your life fully to Jesus. We want to hear about it and celebrate with you and help you in those first steps. Connecting in to share the joys and the struggles of life is why we're here. 
Finding community is super important too, so if you're wondering about any of our programs for kids, youth or adults, just reach out to us by phone or at the link below and we'll be in touch. To all of those who are partnering financially with us, thank you for your investment into the Kingdom of God. It allows us to do what He's calling us to and reach even more people. For more info on that, go over to harvestconnect.ca slash give. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live stream chat area at harvestconnect.ca slash live. It's a great place for interaction, commenting, prayer with our online hosts, and more. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our social pages and all that good stuff too. Take care, keep living your call, and we'll see you again real soon.